Brother Center Point Church, so glad you can join us today on Sunday. Let's get ready to worship our Lord together. Amen. Hey! With a broken heart You picked me up and now I'm set apart From the ash I am born again Forever safe in the Savior's hands You are more than my words can say I'll follow you, Lord, for all my days Fix my eyes following your ways Forever free in an ending grace
this, Lord, we thank you so much, Father. You are so good. Your love endures forever. Your love never fails, Father. And it delivers us from our chains of bondage, the chains of our past. You deliver us to the promised land, Father, and may we focus on you and all that you've done for us. Lord, as we transition into a time of teaching, open up our hearts, fill us with your word, with your truth, your knowledge, your presence, Lord. Thank you, Father. You're so good. In your son's precious name, amen, church, amen. Hello, Center Point. Welcome. My name is Brett. So glad that you are here with us today. We just had an awesome time of worship, and we're going to continue with our teaching series today, The Myth of More. We're going to be hearing from Pastor Brian in just a moment. But first, I want to welcome all of our guests. If you are here checking out Center Point for the first time, we're so glad that you are here. Would you do us a huge favor and fill out our digital connect card? It's a way for us to know know that you are here with us, but also get to know a little bit more about you. See how we might be able to partner with you in your journey of faith. Let us know uh, where you're at. If you have questions about God or the church, we'd love to connect with you um, and help in any way we can. And also, please don't be shy. If you're watching live, let us know that you're watching. Say, uh, say hi in the chat. Let us know that you're here. If you need prayer, we have hosts and prayer team members who are who would be uh, who would love to pray with you today. So please don't be shy. Join in in the chat uh, today here at Center Point. And if you are a Center Point person, this is your home church. We want to say thanks for your continued support, your generosity in giving. Um, you remember, you can give at cpchurch dot com slash give but if you're here as a guest today you're here for the first time we don't expect uh first time visitors to give we don't we're not into receiving donations from strangers on the internet so please feel free to just sit back relax and enjoy the rest of the service today and we're going to move to the message in just a moment but we have a special essential news announcement to make regarding one of the best things about summer at center point if you are a kid uh, it is vbs and uh, i would want to share this video with you all and then we're going to hear from pastor brian as he brings the message guys have a great day so glad you're here and i'll see you in the chat god bless for the most epic adventure ever? Next summer, Group VBS is taking kids on a ride they'll never forget. Get on board the Rocky Railway. Your church will be on track at Sing and Play Express. With Jesus to lead us, we're on the right track. Get ready for high energy fun at Locomotion Games. Experience impactful Bible lessons in Bible adventures. You'll have amazing discoveries at Imagination Station. Take a glimpse into the world of five awesome kids who learned that Jesus' power pulls us through. The best part of summer is full steam ahead at Rocky Railway.
Well, hello, Center Point. It is so good having all of you with us, especially because today we are wrapping up our series, The Myth of More, on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday. And as we are, we are talking about the myth of more regarding money. Now, before you run away, you turn off, you blank out, hear me on this. This is probably the one that the majority of us struggle with out of the different things that we have talked about. Some of you are like, yeah, I'm not worried about success. I have no plans. Uh, Last week, we talked about pleasure. And for some of you, you're like, yeah, that's not my issue. But when it comes to money, when it comes to what money does, what it provides, what we're able to do as a result of it, here's the thing. Very few of you are hippie enough where this is not part of your life. Very few of us are like, oh yeah, I don't care about money. It has no grip on my soul. If we're being honest, this is probably the one out of the four that we need to hear the most. And and so I'm excited to be able to end this series with teaching on this one myth that so many of us have bought into. And, And so here's where I want to start off. I want to start off with a hypothetical question. How would you answer this question? Money can't buy me blank. I actually want to hear, all right? Money can't buy me what? Give me some answers. Love, time, eternity, peace. Some great answers here in a room full of about 300 people. Thank you, guys. And so we all know this then. We already know the answer, right? You you get it, so we're done. That's all we need to do. You can go home now. You can turn off your TVs, your computers. We got this. The thing is, is even though we probably know the answers as we've been saying through the series, that doesn't mean that we internally have processed and digest the reality of the answers we give. And so here we find King Solomon as we've been going through the book of Ecclesiastes. He's gotten older and he's finally figured this out. And it's interesting because the older we get, I find the more we actually do understand this very principle, that money can't buy you whatever your answer may be. Uh, And so here's what I want you to do. I'd love for you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I'm going to miss saying Ecclesiastes. Just rolled off the tongue for four weeks. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and we're going to be reading verses 10 to 20, but I'm going to take my time going through them so that we can get the fullness of these 10 verses. And the first verse here, chapter 5 verse 10, kind of sets up the the entirety of the message. It's kind of like this anchor verse that he's going to start with and then spend the rest of the time explaining. And this is what he says, Ecclesiastes 5.10. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. Here Solomon lays down for us his philosophy of money, not just from his own life, but perceiving it in the lives of those around him. This is going to come to a huge shock for any of you that have been watching each week, but he says that money ultimately, wait for it, is meaningless. But I think it's important for you to see what he says is meaningless about money. Because he doesn't say that money is meaningless. He says loving it, loving money is what is meaningless. You know, we find a very similar thing in the New Testament with the Apostle Paul. He writes in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10, that for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul's just really stating what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, that the love of money has an impact on us, that it has a deeply negative consequence if it's something that we've elevated to this position of loving and desiring within our life. Again, they're not saying that money in itself is meaningless or an economy is meaningless, but the love of money is meaningless. Think about it this way. Solomon is a king. And as a king, that means he gets to make rules. He gets to make decrees. He gets to make his nation any way he wants. And so hypothetically, as the king of Israel, he could have said money is evil. So we're going to do away with money. 
Actually, Israel is now going to be a huge commune. We're just going to share everything. Whatever you have is everyone else's and vice versa because money is ultimately evil. But he doesn't do that, does he? That's not what he's saying here. He's saying the love of money is what's wrong. And Solomon and Paul both understood this, that when you love money, it owns you. It can destroy you. It becomes a God, an ultimate to you. And this is so important to state because I'm talking about money and some of you are thinking, you know what, I'm so glad I'm poor. This message doesn't apply to me. It doesn't matter. My bank account is in the red. I have so much debt that I don't have to pay attention anymore. But that's not the case, friends. This is not a message for the wealthy. You can be rich and not love money and you can be poor and be completely obsessed with it. So anyone in any economic state needs to hear and apply the wisdom of Solomon. Because the question is that we have to wrestle with internally ourselves, is money the primary motivation for your life and your life decisions? Is money that thing that is always dictating what you do, where your time goes, how you live your life, what you're driving your life towards? Does it all come back ultimately to the desire for more money? Have you even subconsciously, emotionally put so much weight on your bank account or on your future bank account or on what your hopefully future spouse may or may not make? I always wanted to marry rich. I always thought that would be a great deal. You know what I mean? And we put so many hopes and dreams on the lotto. <laughs> hopes and dreams on the random uncle we've never met dying and getting an inheritance. So much hopes and dreams on ultimately getting to this place of safety financially where we no longer have to worry about anything. All of those are part of the myth of more. And here in Ecclesiastes, Solomon continues to this next section. I want to read it for you, Ecclesiastes 5. I'm going to start again at verse 10. I want to read down to verse 14. He says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of the laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But it's for the rich... Their abundance permits them no sleep. I have seen the grievous evil under the sun. Wealth hoarded to, harm, uh, to the harm of its owners. Or wealth lost through some misfortune. So that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. So how did Solomon fill in this question that we started with? How did he fill in the blank? Money can't buy me. Well, he actually teaches us a few things here that he fills in the blank for us. Three that I want to highlight. And the first one that he reveals to us is that money can't buy me satisfaction. Money can't buy me satisfaction. Look at verse 10 one last time. Because when he says whoever loves money never has enough, whoever loves wealth is never what? Satisfied. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied. John Rockefeller was asked, how much money is enough? And his answer, just a little bit more, <laughs> right? Because you can never have enough of it. Well, once you get enough, you realize it actually wasn't enough. And then you're going to want more on top of that. Let me ask you, are any of you here online are any of you done making a little bit more money? Is anyone at that point where you're just like, I'm good. I am not going to worry about another dollar. I don't need any more money from Social Security. I don't need a, a, another paycheck. I don't need any more returns on my investments. I have all the money I ever want to get for the rest of my life. Is anyone there yet? Because chances are, outside of one unique unicorn in our church, chances are the answer is no. We're all still trying to get more. Even if we're at the stage of life where maybe we don't 
need it. See, it's not just money, it's also what money buys that creates the lack of satisfaction, the, the desire to get more money so we can ultimately get more stuff. You, you buy a dress or a nice suit, well, now you need to accessorize it. I love accessorizing. I won't even pretend, right? I, I get a, a nice new outfit. I need to get a new belt, new shoes, maybe a new tie, something to go with it, a new band for my iPhone just because you have to, right? You want to accessorize, you want to add, you get a nice new car. It's great for the first year or two, but then it gets a scrape. Then a new model comes out. The new model looks better than the old model, and suddenly your new car is an old car, you get a new house, you're thrilled to finally get your new house, but now you see all the ways you want to fix it up. The things that are outdated, the things that you want to uh, um, update and upgrade and make better than it was before. No, we're never satisfied. We never simply look around and say, I've arrived. That's not true. My grandma hit that point when she was satisfied. I remember because nothing in her house changed after 30 years. I don't know what age that happens, but I think it was a generational thing. But I remember my, my great-grandmother, right? You'd walk in the house, nothing changed for 30 years. It was everything still from the 80s and 2010. Nothing, ever, she was like, oh, I'm good. But for most of us, we don't ever get there. We want more. We want to be satisfied with what we're hoping money could ultimately buy. And so what is Solomon saying? You can't buy this level of satisfaction. It doesn't come from money. It doesn't come from stuff. You're never going to obtain satisfaction through your financial state. It may feel good along the way. Don't get me wrong. But it's never going to satisfy the bigger quest and question that he's asking. Is this the purpose of my reality? I do want to add some quick balance here, though. Because even though he says wealth is never satisfying, that it's never going to create this satisfaction, th th this doesn't mean that it's wrong to make more money. I, I just want to kind of level the playing field real quick here because there's a difference between still doing fine for yourself and not passing up a, a, a raise. Your boss comes to you and say, hey, you want a raise? You're like, no, I'm satisfied. Thank you very much. Give it to someone else, right? Uh, this isn't saying like, hey, you know what? You're at this point. You know, you're, you're still trying to gain your, your wealth to prepare for retirement. You don't have to take it all out of retirement right now and then do what my great-grandmother did do and put all the $100 bills under her mattress. That was a Sicilian thing, I think. She was, she was really big on hiding money all throughout the house because she was scared the banks were gonna steal it. No, it's not saying that you can't have these investments and still make more money. What Solomon is ultimately saying, though, is that when we attempt to find our satisfaction in money, it ends like anything else that takes the place of God's satisfaction in our life. It's meaningless. It's the wind. It's the vapor. You know, just real quick, in my own life, I was thinking about this as I was putting this message together because... <clears throat> In my life in ministry, so much of my adulthood, I did not care about money. I just, I really didn't because I wasn't making enough to care. I mean, there's a reality to that. My, my wife was either in grad school or we're raising the kids and uh, um, my income was lower and most of my adult life was spent pretty highly in debt. Now, part of that was another issue of the myth of more of spending and buying. I'm not going to pretend otherwise, but nonetheless. And a couple years ago, about two years ago, I shared that, that I'd finally gotten to the point with my family and my finances that we are out of credit card debt for like the first time in our life, in our marriage. And the irony is, for those 15 years when I was in credit card debt, guess what I didn't worry about? I didn't worry about money. <laughs> uh, I got no satisfaction from it. But the moment that I finally got out of debt and I started putting a little bit into savings... <laughs> And I started thinking about the future. Suddenly now that's all I thought about is, oh, I need to get more so I can be satisfied, so I can have this fulfillment, so I can be ready and prepared. I don't know what flip but something did. Drives my wife absolutely mad when for the first time ever, I'm like, hey, are you using coupons? 
using those CVS coupons? You better use those CVS coupons. Those, those are not there just to waste paper. Those are important coupons that you need to use. She's like, you didn't worry about coupons when we had nothing, when we were in debt. Why are you worried about them now? I'm like, I don't know, I just am. Suddenly there's a satisfaction I was hoping to obtain within it. And we all find that within ourselves in different ways. Solomon continues with the second thing that money can't buy. Money can't buy me peace. Look again at verses 11 and 12. He says, as God increases, so do those who consume them. I'm sorry, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except the feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. He says a lot here in these two verses. In essence, the more you have, it just means the more you're going to consume. And if you have lots of stuff, then at the end of the day, it's just good to look at. But who really cares? What's the real value that has been added to your soul, to your person, to your being, to, your six, uh, um, to, to the, the purpose of who you are? And more stuff just means more to take care of. More stuff just means more to worry about. There is no peace in the myth of more. And then Solomon says that when people have a lot of money, they go to bed at night, but they can't sleep. They can't sleep because of the worry that presents itself. It creates a lack of peace. Uh, I'm wondering right now, how many people have bought cryptocurrency in the last few months? Or how many people have gone under Robin Hood and started doing stocks through COVID? That just became this, this big trend where people have no idea about the stock market, no idea what even cryptocurrency is yet. You see all the scams, like there, there, there are people that are literally buying, buying gold coins that say Bitcoin on them for $10,000 because it's a deal and it's something physical. Like, oh, I got Bitcoin. No, you got scammed. But how many people over the, the last year started to dip their toe into the financial market and now every night they wake up at three in the morning terrified. It, it, did Bitcoin drop another $5,000? Did, did their stocks tank? Suddenly feeling an anxiety that they've never felt before. Why? Because money can't buy us peace. Oh, Elon Musk, stop playing God, Right? Calm down already. Leave my cryptocurrency alone. <laughs> and so Solomon's saying, no, this other thing that's so incredible to living a good life. Peace is one of the most important things to enjoying life. You cannot enjoy life if you don't have peace. And he's saying money does not actually buy that. It doesn't help to that end. If anything, it hurts. The third thing he then tells us is money can't buy security. Money can't buy security. Verse 13 and 14. It says, I've seen a grievous evil under the sky. Wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners or wealth lost through some misfortune so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Um, Solomon says some interesting things about inheritance. He actually says something very different earlier in Ecclesiastes 2, 18 to 23, where he says that when he dies, his sons will have what he worked so hard to get and that he has no control over it, that they didn't work for it, so they're probably going to waste it. And now he's saying that the only thing worse than handing over your fortune to your kids who waste it is not having anything to give them. He gives some mixed messages a little bit here in Ecclesiastes. But he ties this idea of inheritance to this point. That all it takes is a moment of misfortune and it can all be gone. All it takes is one moment of misfortune and all this that you've acquired suddenly vanishes. He's saying there's, there's no actual security in this inheritance that you hope is being built up for the next generations. No matter how much you have, there's no real security to it because the world is out of your control. The famine is out of your control. The weather is out of your control. The stock market is out of your control. COVID is out of your control. Things that you think are so stable, 
Things that you think, no, this, this has got me. I never have to worry again. And then suddenly a bubble bursts. And what you put your hope and your trust and your future in is no longer present. He's like, no, the, the money can't actually buy you security. It can give you a false sense of security. It, it can make you for a season feel like everything is covered no matter what goes on, but you truly do not know what is going to happen in the world. I mean, can you think of a better example than the past year and a half? It changed everything. Economies flipped upside down. Industries that were thriving suddenly tank. Uh, other industries that were tanking suddenly thrived. I mean, no one could have predicted the financial outcome of COVID and all of the quarantining and everything else that came with it. Why? Because you can't control it. And so he's saying, even in this, you don't have security. So money can't buy satisfaction, peace, peace. Or security. He's saying, listen, at the end of the day, this cannot be the purpose of life. It's not going to provide what we really need to have the deepest satisfaction in life and the most significance in life. So then what is the answer? What's his wisdom to the myth of more on money? Well, he now transitions at verse 15. And he wants to spend a little time teaching us the secret of the myth of more on money. Teaching us the reality of contentment. How to be content. And he gives us three keys to contentment. I gave you three things money can't buy, so now I want to give you three quick things that contentment can give. And here's the first one. We need to know that our days are short. We need to know that our days are short. Look at Ecclesiastes 5, 15 to 17. He says, everyone comes naked from their mother's womb. And as everyone comes... So they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Such a poet. I'm serious. This man missed his career at Hallmark. You know what I'm saying? Know your days are short. This is actually so much of the premise of Ecclesiastes is understanding the reality of time, understanding the reality of seasons, understanding the reality of, uh, of what makes life significant when you start to number your days. And it does radically change you. When my dad ended up having to have a lung transplant, that, that was a, a very finite moment for him. There was this this moment in life where leading up to the transplant, not knowing if it would work or not at all, first you're like, okay, that it could be the day that I die. But the transplant did work, at least for a little bit, but after it happened, he knew that there was a definitive timeline now. I, I believe most people with a lung transplant don't live beyond six or seven years. And so right then in that moment, he had this new reality that, okay, I, I probably at best have six or seven years. I think he only got about a year and a half until the lung stopped working and he passed away. But I got to tell you, there was a change in him <laughs> once he got sick and even more so when he said, okay, I have a timeline. I'm only going to be on this earth for a limited number of days. And it instantly changes your priorities when that happens. Because suddenly you want to get the most out of every day. You, you want to live a different life than you did before because what you were doing before, you know so much of that was nonsense in the grand scheme of things. I mean, of course, you need to live, you need to work, you need to provide. You, you still have certain responsibilities you have to do that if I said, hey, you're going to be gone in a week, you probably wouldn't care about. But, but Solomon is saying, no, you have to realize you, that in your life, your days are ultimately short. And all through Ecclesiastes, he's challenging us with this very thought. To live knowing that you won't live forever. That's not a depressing way to live. That's a way to live to the fullest. That doesn't take away from our life. That gives to our life. When you're like, you know what? I'm not going to be here forever. So what am I going to do with this one life that I've been given? How am I going to live in a way that is significant knowing that the end actually isn't that far off? I think everyone hits a point as they age, where their mortality hits them. 
For me, it was 39. I don't know why. I thought it was going to be 40. It wasn't 40. 39 rocked me. I was invincible up until 39. I was heading to my 39th birthday. It was about a month before when I realized, like, I don't know, because maybe it was almost 40. I didn't have, like, this midlife crisis where I bought a convertible because I couldn't afford it, or else I might have, or a motorcycle because I couldn't afford it, but I would have. But instead, I, I just had, had this crisis of moment where I'm like, man, I, I'm, I'm on my way out. Who knows when? It could be tomorrow. But something about 39, I went from feeling like I was Superman to Pee Wee Herman. Like it just shifted quickly. I don't know why I went to Pee Wee Herman. I mean, who, who's even thought of Pee Wee Herman in decades? But that's who I thought of. The opposite of Superman is clearly Pee Wee Herman. And that's what happened in that moment. This shift happened. I'm like, man, I'm going to die. <laughs> And I'm not saying my life flipped upside down, but I do think since that moment, there has been a difference in the way that I see every day. Certainly, I'm not conscious of it every day in this clear way. I'm certainly not that deep. But I got to tell you that there is a truth when you start to say, okay, you know what? My, My time with my kids are more important and precious than they were the day before That what I do in ministry, what I do for the kingdom of God starts to echo louder because I'm like, all right, there's limited time that's left. I look at friendships, relationships. When I look at the simple pleasures of life, it's like, no, you know what? I need to find satisfaction in the day today because I don't know how many days I have left. And so he's trying to get that point across. Know that your days are short. And then brings us to what I just mentioned. The next thing that he gives us advice to find contentment is to find satisfaction in the day-to-day. Look at verse 18. He says, this is what I've observed to be good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor. Under the sun, during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Uh, this phrase here, this is their lot, is kind of like saying it is what it is in our, uh, our vernacular. Hey, have you ever said that at work? You're there going through your day, doing what you do on a regular basis, and you're just like, you know what? It is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is, and, and I'm going to be okay with whatever I'm doing because this is where I find myself today. This is the circumstance that I'm in, and I'm not going to complain about it. I'm not going to fight against it. I'm not going to go around just being angry about it. it. It is what it is. It's my lot in life. It's the situation I find myself in. Because the truth is, there's always going to be problems in the workplace. And there's always going to be another job that you wish that you were doing. But just because there are problems, just because there's frustrations, just because it's not your dream job or the ideal scenario that you wish you found yourself in, it doesn't mean that your work is pointless. It's actually what Solomon is saying here. He's saying, no, listen, find satisfaction in your toilsome labor. Like there's something significant about it. There's something good about it. There, 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 there's something where you can have a level of satisfaction in this day-to-day toil that we do. But if you're always complaining, if you're always just dreaming about what else you could have been doing, it's going to be hard to find contentment. Whether you're at home raising kids or working for a company, if you have food on the table and something to drink, you get to choose to say, I'm good. Life is good. I'm okay with this. I'm all right that I have this. My, my, My stomach's full. I have my family around me. There's a roof over my head. He's saying you need to find contentment in this because if you can't find contentment in that, you're not gonna find contentment in anything. You choose. Hear me. You choose contentment. It's a choice. It's a willingness to say, this is okay. To say, you know, I, I, I'm just thankful for the scenario that I find myself in. And this is so contrary to what we're often say, are taught and what we say and how we live. We're always about the myth of more. <laughs> I need something else. I need to have a better job. I need to move forward. I need to progress. And he's saying, hey, bro, here's the deal. 
find satisfaction in your toilsome labor. (laughs) Be okay with where you are. And this is really only possible if you realize that all work is meaningful when you do it as for the Lord. In Colossians 2.23, it says, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord. And that's the attitude that no matter what you're doing, God's put you in a place, this is where you found yourself, then you need to do it not simply for your boss or for your company, but you need to do it for the glory of God, saying, how can I do this in a way that honors him? How can I do this in a way that brings him glory? How can I do this as an act of worship? It may feel like toilsome labor or boring labor or obnoxious labor, but when you're doing it for the glory of God, there's a contentment that you can still find in any scenario you're in. I'm promising you some people need to hear this message right now because you're miserable every day and you're allowing your misery to consume you. You're making a annoying situation or a bad situation into a horrible situation because of the attitude in which you bring to it. When instead, as you're at work, you need to go into it saying, I'm going to do this for the glory of God. Again, I'm not saying it's wrong to want to advance in your career. I'm not saying it's wrong to get a better job. That's not the point here. But while you are trying, you still need to be content with today. Why do you think God's going to bless you with something new if you can't be godly with what he's given you already? A lot of times we're like, God, where's my blessing? Where's my advancement? Where's my new career? While all the while we're complaining and bitter and gossiping and doing a, a halfway job. And we're like, God, give me something better. Maybe God's saying, listen, when you can be content with where you are, then I can provide you the blessing with what's next. Do it all for the glory of God. Which brings me to the final point on contentment. To be content is to know God's gifts are great. I love how Solomon concludes chapter five, because he actually finally says something really positive, like legitimately. You can like, oh, look, okay, I don't have to run away, live in a cave, and never talk to another human being again. This is good. And this is what he says, starting in verse 19, he says, moreover, when God gives you some, uh, sorry, moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. And here in verse 19, we see that we get to learn that God's gifts are great. It tells us in verse 19 that everything we have, first and foremost, is in fact a gift from God. Everything we have is a gift from God. Anything good, anything pleasing is God's gift to us. It also tells us that even the ability to earn what we have is a gift from God. It's not about us. It's not simply what we're doing out of our own intellect, out of our own strength. Even all of that is still God's gift to us. And then he says that even the ability to enjoy it is a gift from God. Any pleasure, as we talked about last week, any pleasure that we get to enjoy these gifts, that's Also, in fact, a gift from God that he has given us. In other words, I'll sum it up. It's all about God. (laughs) Everything in life that is good and pleasing and enjoyable is a gift from God. Everything you like about yourself, everything you think is what makes me marketable. Anything that we have, it is all a gift from God. And what I love here is Solomon closes with some balance. He ends this chapter with a little upbeat news. As you are blessed, as long as you can see it as God who blesses, you can enjoy the blessing he gives you. You can enjoy it. But friends, hear me. If you're going to find contentment in it, if it's not going to be meaningless, then you have to see that it's from him and is for him. And it's all about his glory in the process. And as soon as we've said every week, you put anything above him, that is when we find that ultimately it is meaningless. And so here we are. We have learned the myth of more regarding knowledge, success, pleasure, and money. 
Can we as a church be a people that can avoid making these mistakes as putting these things as idols in our life? Can we see all of these things that God has in fact given us in the right place, not as something to worship, but as something to enjoy as an act of worship to our God? Because if we don't, we will spend our life chasing after the wind. And no matter how much someone may think that you've succeeded, that you've achieved, that you have the the dream life, if God is not first, friends, it has all been meaningless. So let's be thankful for what God has given us and break free from the chains that have held us down and live in the satisfaction that God has given us as his people and live in the fullest life that we could ever dream or imagine. Life is, in fact, a gift from God. Let us live it in that light. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you so much for this series, this message. God, I pray that anyone who just needed to hear the reality that we can no longer let money be our God, it can no longer be our idol, it can no longer be the thing that we hope is going to bring that ultimate uh, satisfaction. God, that we can lay that at the foot of your cross and say, Lord, we want you above all of it. God, we want to put money in its rightful place. We want to be people with a generous heart. God, we don't want money to control us, but we want to control what you've blessed us with so that it doesn't bring us down. We don't want money to be the thing or the love of money to be the thing that brings us to evil thoughts or actions or pulls us away from our family or, Lord God, does something else that ultimately hinders and hurts our soul. So God, we lift this up to you. Forgive us in areas that we need forgiven regarding our finances. Lord, may we thank you for every blessing that you have given us. We lift this up to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus. 
continue to work within our lives so we can understand that there's nothing in this world that can satisfy us that that temptation of wanting more the temptation of receiving more that that will fill us Lord that's it's all a myth everything in this world will fade but your love endures forever Thank you for that, Father. Thank you for this time of worship. It's all to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Center Point Church, I'm so glad you joined us today. Hope you were blessed by the message. God bless you guys, and I'll see you guys next Sunday. Take care. <laughs>